here. We made it. We have a special guest with us today, Simon Lieberman, who comes to us for the Bay Area. Welcome, Simma. Hey, nice to be here, Christopher. Audience, we are about to explore areas in which many companies and corporations are attempting to seeking to wrap their minds around desperately in search of substantive direction and guidance, reconciliation, reckoning, and understanding. Let's chop wood. Who is Simon Lieberman? Who am I? Well, I, besides being a, a human being, I, in terms of work and what I do, well, first of all, I'm a white Jewish woman from the Bronx living in Berkeley, California. That's a whole different transition. And my work is, I have a podcast on race, Everyday Conversations on Race for Everyday People. It's a cross-race conversation on race uh, that shows people that you can have those conversations. And that's a lot of my life. My life has been bringing people together across differences and getting people to actually listen to each other and hear each other and uh, stop fear of differences and eliminate hate. And I'm also a consultant. I help create inclusive work cultures in organizations and I work with leaders to be more inclusive. So I guess you would say I'm a diversity, equity and inclusion consultant, author and speaker. Let's run with it. Diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. Yes. We hear these terms in this industry wide array, subject to interpretation. There's different understandings of these terminologies. I certainly know that I've had my fair share of audiences to express and speak on these subjects. I've come to appreciate that with the narrative of diversity, it's diverse and that there's different understandings that are being expressed to C-suite on down and back up again. Sema, from your lens and from your expertise, what is diversity inclusion, equity, belonging today. Okay, I've been doing this a long time. I've been doing this work over 25 years. I've seen a lot of changes, but the core really has remained the same in terms of how I see it and other people in my circle see it. That diversity is actually all the differences and similarities that people bring, if you look at it and work in the organ, into organizations with all the tensions and all the complexities that diversity brings. And that definition actually comes from the late Roosevelt Thomas, who's one of the first people to talk about, actually talk about diversity in organizations. When we talk about inclusion, we look at, so you have a lot of diversity. You have people from all different backgrounds. But what happens when people come into an organization? If people don't feel included, if they don't feel like they belong, that they have a right to be there and that they have a say in the organization, they will leave that organization. Because represent if you just have representation alone, I always say it looks good in the company photo, but eventually people will, will leave. If you don't use people's strengths and abilities People are going to leave. If you just have diversity, say, oh, we have like five black people, five brown people, five Asian people, whatever, and you're not utilizing people's brilliance, number one, you're losing talent. You're losing what these people can do for your organization, and you're going to lose people. And then belonging is, I feel like I belong, because my belief is this, that no matter how long people are at work and in life, whether it's an hour, 10 hours, 20 hours, whatever, people want to feel part of something greater than themselves. And at work, it's feeling like that people are feeling part of a community. And that's a sense of belonging. Because if you say, okay, you have representation, say you're like a, a black person working in an organization, we'll say a tech organization, because I hear this so often where you have people in tech say, oh, we just couldn't find any, we got to go to high schools, we got to go to junior high schools. I'm saying, if that's true, why is it that I go to so many 
like tech inclusion or diversity in tech conferences. And I keep on running into particularly black and brown people who tell me they have, they're computer scientists, they're engineers, uh, they're techies. And when they do get into, either they don't get hired or when they do get into an organization, no one asks them for their opinion. No one asks for their advice. They're completely underutilized and they're completely underestimated. And in fact, they're, oftentimes they're invisible and ignored. So if you, if you talk about diversity, inclusion, and belonging, you're talking about bringing people into your organization from all differences. It's not just race, but all differences, disability, age, all of that. And you're looking at what do these people bring to this organization? How can they help the organization? And how can they help themselves? And how do you create that community? And we look at equity is how do we give people the tools that they need to be able to do their best work? Because somebody might say, well, we have equality. Everybody has the same chance, but people may not have, they may not have the opportunity to do what they can do. For instance, if you have somebody in a wheelchair and they could be the most brilliant person in the world, and you could say, well, everybody has a chance to succeed. But if you don't create an environment in that organization, if you don't look at like how even just the eye, if in an office, the aisles that have to, people have to go through in a wheelchair, or if somebody's blind, if you don't figure out a way to get them the information that they need, they will not be able to do their best work. So with equity, we're looking at what do we need to do to give people the tools they need to do their best work? And it's not the same for everybody. So everybody has to have equal opportunity, equality, but everybody need equity for people to be able to access that opportunity. Dope. I'm right there with you. Let's go back for a moment. You said it yourself, New York, Jewish, white woman, was it? Yeah. When I surveyed the land of DNI experts, and there's a lot, diversity, oh. equity, there's a lot in companies and corporations, most of them, admittedly, don't look like you. Let's go back. Let, let's go back because what I often believe is that those in this professional arena, horizontally, they are what they've become. And that it's taken for many years in the making beyond degrees to shape and form what it is that they do for a profession, so guidance, and leaders. Let's go back. Let, we're in the Bay Area, but we're going, I think we need to go back to New York. Give How me what I you get got. Into this? How did Give I, me what I, you got. Who am I? How did I get into this? What's my history with this? Okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you very easily. When I was in school, number one, well, there's two things. One, when I was in school, it wasn't that long ago from the, it was maybe like 20 years after the Holocaust had ended. And so we had people in our neighborhood who had numbers on their arms from being in the concentration camps. And maybe because it was so soon after the Holocaust, when I was in school, and these teachers were not progressive or anything like that, but it, I guess it was required we learned about the Holocaust. We learned about slavery. We learned about the civil rights movement. And we learned, and what they did was they made, or at least I made parallels between the Holocaust and, 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 and slavery. I made parallels between the death camps and plantations. And when they talked about like Harriet Tubman being like black Moses, I'm like, yeah, hey, I can relate to that. So she was my hero when I was like eight years old. And then around that time, uh, my synagogue got attacked by these young white Irish Catholic kids. They attacked us while we were in synagogue on the holiest day of the year. Well, I guess they probably knew it was the holiest day of the year that we'd all be in synagogue. And they started throwing stuff at us and calling us names. And I was really scared. And I remember thinking just at that age, these people don't know me. They don't know us. How can they hate us so much? And I said, I want to get, well, I wanted to get to know people who were different than me so that they wouldn't hate me and I wouldn't hate them. But I was so afraid. I said to myself, the only way that I'm gonna feel really safe, and it was personal, is to be with other people who are not like the white, um, I guess you'd say white dominant culture people that for me to feel safe, I need to be around other people who have had similar experiences. And so when I was eight, I, you know, and I, I started having black, you know, I, we didn't have a lot of black people 
in our neighborhood at that time until I was in junior high school. But I started becoming friends with black kids. And I went on my first picket line when I was eight years old. I was, um, I was walking down the street with my friend and her mother, and I'll never forget this. We saw people, there were people marching up and down in front of Woolworths. Remember Woolworths? I don't know if you remember Woolworths. And they were saying, I'll never forget this. I was eight years old, but they were Ice saying- Ice cream. Yeah, and they were saying, one, two, three, four, don't go in here anymore. Two, four, six, eight, Southern Woolworths segregate. And I said to my friend's mother, I said, what, you know, what, what are they doing? And she said, because she said they're marching for integration. She said, because in Southern Woolworths in the South, black people cannot sit at the lunch counter and eat with white people. And I remember thinking, well, because I had a friend named Edith. I said, that means that I can't eat lunch with Edith? That's just wrong. And I said, let's get on, let's start marching. So I went on my first march. And then after that, I got involved in a lot of civil rights work. I started get, getting involved in community organizing. I actually joined a white group called the Young Patriots. And they worked in New York with the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords. So we were all in a coalition. So we worked in the white community. The Black Panthers worked in the black community. The Young Lords worked in the Puerto Rican community. Um, and I think that there's like, a, um, and, and actually if you saw the movie, uh, black Miss Jewish and the Black Messiah in Chicago, they showed how the Black Panther Party was instrumental in getting the young patriots to work with them. It was a very powerful scene in my opinion, but I joined the one in New York. And so I was very involved in community organizing and, um, and I started working in dialogues. We started having dialogues that bring people, we had black, brown and white people together and we would have dialogues. We'd have people actually talk to each other. And that's what I did in community organizing. And so that was, that, was always my, that was always my life. I mean, for a long time, that was my life about bringing people together across differences. I was involved in Jewish Palestinian groups to bring Jews and Palestinians together to talk to each other. And, uh, and I moved from the Bronx to Eugene, Oregon, which was really weird. I didn't even know people like that existed, but we had a, Panther, a Black Panther Party and uh, Young Patriots, and there was a Brown Berets worked with Chicano movement, and we all worked together. And then I moved down here. I, I actually I went to school for holistic health. I got my master's degree in holistic health because my idea was to bring holistic health to all the different communities. Because, you know, for a lot, I mean, a lot of personal reasons, but, but then I started looking at what was going on in organizations, and I said, "Wow, I wish." that I could do the work that I'm doing in an organization. I didn't know anything about corporate America. I didn't even know what HR was. I was an hourly employee. Then I had worked in the health field in teaching biofeedback and stress management, but I still didn't know what corporate was about. And I ended up getting a couple of contracts. I really, I didn't know what HR was, there's no internet. I couldn't even ask anybody, but I knew from going up in the Bronx, I knew how to, you know, um, what, you know, just kind of like, go along to get along and just kind of pretend, yeah, okay. But um, I didn't know what anything was, but then I said, I really want to do, I didn't know what, I can't remember what it was called diversity or whatever in organizations. And um, I ran into a friend of mine who, I'm telling you the whole story. I don't know if you want me to hear the whole story. I don't know, I'm going on and on. Yeah, go on. So uh, I ran into a friend of mine at a party who was one of the, she, at the time, Apple was pretty cool with diversity at that particular time in the early days. And I said, I, what I wanted to do, and she was the highest ranking black woman at Apple. And she was like up in the senior, senior level. And she said, well, you want to meet the head of diversity for Apple? And I, like I said, I knew nothing about corporations. I go, yeah, I don't even know how you meet those people. And she introduced me to him and he introduced me to other people. And he introduced me to a man named Price Cobbs who wrote the book, Black Rage. And Price Cobbs really encouraged me. And from there, I met my, I had mentors and that's how I ended up doing the work. And I still didn't really understand how corporations work. I didn't understand about systems. I be, started doing training. And, um, and my first real mentor, Rafael Gonzalez, who's since passed away, said, well, you know, you gotta understand the systems and how organizations work. And um, he started teaching me about that. And so I went from being a trainer to actually being a consultant, to looking at change, and then I still separated, I still separated corporate work from social justice on the outside. 
because really the people were doing like the social justice people were anti-corporate. The corporate people were saying, no, it's not just about doing the right thing. But you know, the last couple of years after people became aware of all the murders of, of, of black and brown people by police and white citizens and we were quarantined, there started to be an integration of social justice and corporate. And that's and that's what that's and that's what I'm doing now. My work is really integrating social justice, corporate work, and like my podcast. So that that's that's essentially who I am and how I got into this work. And I know, you know, some people like I've heard some white people say, well, you know, um, how do you do this work? You're white or whatever, blah, 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 blah. I've never had any issues. I work in South Central LA. I've never had any issues because when you start talking to people, you'll find out who you are and your experiences are, you know, and being willing to listen. But I mean, I think, you know, you're talking about a lot of diversity consultants I'm, and I'm going on and on and on. But uh, there's a lot of people who become DEI consultants. They really don't know what they're doing. I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of really good people, but there's a lot of people who really don't know what they're doing. They may understand like one particular issue, but they don't understand the whole issue. And also, they understand what's going on in the US, but they really don't understand what's going on in the whole world. And for me, I think you have to have a holistic point of view. You have to look at it from the inside. Who are you inside to be able to work on your outside? You got to understand what's going on in the world. You got to understand systems. Let's roll with that for a second. What is the difference between real, authentic DEI practice and understanding and those that put that label on their LinkedIn? Let's let's take it there. Roll up some sleeves. Okay. Well, for instance, I've known people, and I'm talking about white people right now, I mean, who have done like say that they're DEI consultants, and then they have a party or a wedding or whatever, and and I'll go, and there's not one person of color. They're all, you know, everybody's white. And I'm like, wait a minute. You're telling me you're a DEI consultant, but you don't live it. You have to live it, in my opinion, and, and from what I know, wow. all my years. If you don't live it, then it's not for real, you know? What do you mean? You don't know anybody who's disabled. You're still making jokes. You're laughing at jokes. No, that. You're not, you're only working on one issue. No, that's not a real DEI consultant. You could say you're an expert in a particular issue, but if you're going to really do DEI, you have, in my opinion, you have to be holistic and you have to have it inside you. It's not something that you just go and do, but then you go home to like your little enclave and you don't know anybody who's different than you. That's not for, for me, that is not for real. And, and instead, and you know, and I do a lot of work with inclusive, inclusive leadership and you know, it's easy in the beginning. You say, okay, if you want to be inclusive, you do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You do these behaviors. Okay, that's cool. But if you don't have it inside you, what's going to happen when you expect that you're going to do a certain behavior somewhere or practice, and it doesn't work with that particular group? What are you going to do? And you have to, you know, you have to be. It has to be inside you. You have to feel it has to be part of you. You have to become what they say, unconsciously competent. And until you reach that level, you know, you, and you're kind of bogus. I mean, you could be doing good work, but just having a couple of programs, having a diversity potluck, no. And I've had people say, oh, can you come and do this workshop? And I said, well, what are you doing to affirm your learning? Well, we just need to do this. Well, what are you doing to make change? When I first started doing this work, it was all about training. I, we were getting huge contracts. CEOs were like, okay, can you do this? Can you train like a bazillion people? Okay but nothing ever changed because it wasn't going on. It wasn't in the culture. It has to be in your personal culture. It really does, you know? And I think that I don't, like now when I do my work, I try to find out from people when I'm working with the leaders, what's their personal relationship to diversity? And what do they still need to do? What do they need to learn? And sometimes you could be very surprised. Like you could have somebody, like I had this one white guy in my class, and uh, almost everybody else in the class was black except for him. And he's joking around, making these jokes with people. I'm thinking, what's up with this guy? How, you know, is, is he racist making these jokes? And it turns out he was a white guy, but he had been adopted when he was like two by a black family, you know? And so he was raised totally in black, black American culture. 
And you can't tell, or you could look at somebody, like when I first started doing this work, um, I was, and I was new to the work and I was working with somebody who was very seasoned and I wanted to do good. I wanted to have a good impression. And this one guy in the program, in the class who was black, and he was real cool on racial issues, real cool. And then he starts making like seriously sexist comments. And I'm thinking, oh man, what do I do? He's the only black person, I'm new. Luckily, the other person who I was training with who was black called him out. I mean, you know, or called him in like they say. And I realized that just because somebody's good on one issue doesn't mean that they're good on all issues. And if we're really talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, you got to be good on all issues and you have to feel it. You have to feel it inside. It has to be part of who you are. You know, I mean, Let's, you got to be willing to speak out too. That's the whole other thing. Anyway, go ahead. I hope our audience is taking notes. I am. We have to live it. Great answer. Well accepted. Let's leap from New York because we need to take the plane back and let's come back here to the Bay. And I want to come back to Silicon Valley. Uh, Sima, does Silicon Valley have a diversity problem? Yes, they have a diversity problem. And here's part of it. Let me, but let me, let me, let's hone in and, and go a little bit closer with that. And, and let's take some from Pacific Northwest. I promise we're not picking on anyone, but then again, maybe we are just a little. Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft. Tim Cook, CEO of Apple. Uh, Mark, we're going to bring you in on this. Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, and Instagram, and WhatsApp, Oculus, Facebook Reality Labs. We're, they're in a room. They're sitting down. Sima, does Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, do they have a diversity problem? Run with it. Yeah, they have a problem because a lot of these are a, a, a lot of a lot of these organizations are what's called per, do performative work, in that um, they will spend a lot of money on sponsoring a conference. They will send their DNI person to speak at a conference. They'll put out all this money, but what happens is that the organization still looks exactly the same, or if it looks different, they haven't done any internal work. For instance, Google. Do you remember when, uh, what was his name? James Damore, several years ago. Uh, remember what, what was it? James, James Damore wrote that, uh, that opinion or that creed about women and everybody was so upset and and he said no I just want to make it better I don't want to stop anything you know hopefully about women are more nurturing blah 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 whatever it was and I wrote actually it was really cool because I got on NPR to talk about it and I and I wrote an op-ed that was in uh, San Jose Mercury News so that was that, that was a pretty cool thing but what I said and which I said then and I'm going to say now is that if you're not having the ongoing conversations, that's how you end up with the James Damore. Because if they were having ongoing conversations, if they were making it part of their culture, if they were having opportunities for people to interact, maybe James Damore might not have felt that way. Maybe he would have, because it was like this whole little quiet group, right? Some conclave of people. If you would have explained why you were doing it and people understood, people still have to understand the business reason, maybe, just maybe, they would have been so disgruntled. Maybe they would have understood how it was going to, that diversity was going to help them. And maybe you would have found out that some people didn't even need to be in your organization. And another issue that just happened was Google. Um, recently, and I can't remember his last, his, Amir, and I can't remember his last time, the, um, who was, he, he was Egyptian. I, I actually talked to him on, on the phone. He's a really good guy. He was a senior, senior, senior exec at Google. And he wrote a long essay about how he used to hate Jewish people. And then he talked about how he got to know Jewish people and it took him a while, but how it really changed how he saw Jewish people. And then found out that he was like something like 1% Jewish when he did his DNA. But he wrote that 
explaining everything. And you know what they, you know what happened? They fired him. They fired him saying that he was an anti-Semite or they had been anti-Semitic. That's a problem. That if you really believe, because that was just performative, because here you're still not that diverse. You're still, you know, I mean, you're getting better. But what about your culture? What does that say when you somebody writes about how they used to think a certain way, and then you fire them for that if they talk to you about how they've changed? I mean, I sat, I did a workshop several years ago uh, where we, you know, we go around the room, we ask people what their experiences were. We had this white guy from the South. He talked about the fact that one reason he had so passionate about diversity was because of his family. His family, his family were clans people. They were night riders. He had seen them on night rides. When he was little, they took him out on night rides. He had seen them attack black people. And as a result of that, he changed. And he's totally, he was like one of the biggest champions of diversity. What if we said, no, uh, because what happened to you when you were little, no matter how much you say you've changed, you're gonna be out of it. We're not gonna include you. So I think a lot of it is BS because we have to allow for people to change. And, and then I talk to a lot of black and brown people who have been in these tech companies. And they say that again, that when they were there, they were underutilized, nobody asked for their opinion, that it was all for show. So yeah, there's a problem. There's a big problem. I'm an executive listening to this podcast tonight. I'm an executive listening to this podcast tomorrow. I'm an executive. I know I can do better. I know I need to do right. What's the first move after I end this podcast, after I get done listening to Sima and I'm saying, you know what? She's absolutely right. He What's said, my next move? I'm going to call Sima and her team and I'm going to see what we can do. And then we would talk to them. What is it? What's, you know, we help them create, if they don't have a vision, we help them create a vision. We'd work with them and their senior leadership team to create a strategy for change, but also to work on them inside so that, so that it is an inside out job. So what would we do all these things at once? We're working to look at the culture. What's your culture now? Why is it? Do you have a lot of people of color who aren't staying? Disabled people who aren't staying? Do people feel like they're being discriminated against because they're transgender? You know, because we look at diversity, we're looking at all the different, you know, all different facets of diversity. So we look at what's going on in your organization, help you create the vision, help you and your team internalize it and become unconsciously competent while we're doing all of that. So that it's more than you just saying, oh, I just wanted to look a certain way, but you're saying, I want it to be a certain way. I want it to feel a certain way. And, and it's, it is one step at a time. Yeah, it's the process, but if you don't engage in the process and you have to get out of the thinking that just because you have some new people of color or new disabled people, or new gay, whatever it is that you're cool. Because you have to look at the big picture you want to get people in your organization, but you want to also make sure that your organization is welcoming. You want to make sure that people are learning together and that you're not just asking people to just come in and fit in with your organization, but you're looking at what do I need to do? What kind of environment do I need in my organization? So the people who are, who are different than the dominant culture, whatever that is in that organization, so that they can do their best work, so that they can be most creative. With the few minutes that we have left, I have a few questions. Tell me about Berkeley. Berkeley? Well, I just remember when, when, um, when my son was really little, my partner brought, bought um, our son some toy soldiers. And I remember I said, oh, we're leaving Berkeley now. They'll never let us in. Or uh, one time we had, we had, we had a, um, we, <laughs> We, we had a birthday party for my son. It was like 100 degrees. We had a water gun birthday party. And I remember there was a couple of parents who said, no, that's too aggressive. We don't let our kids play with water guns. So somebody said, what about water balloons? <laughs> they can throw water balloons. They said, no. So Berkeley is a mixture of people. Now, when I first moved onto my block, there were 10 black families. Now there's not, there's like, I think maybe one and some of that is because people have bought their houses for $30,000 and they're like, what? I could get a million dollars for my house, bye. Or a lot of the old people died 
And the, the, the kid's like, no, I'm not staying there. I got my own house in Fairfield or, or wherever. Um, so I think that in a lot of ways, Berkeley has changed. It used to have a lot more diversity from what I could see. Um, I, I'm, I like Berkeley. I like Berkeley okay, I could leave. I lived in Oakland for 20 years. Um, I mean, I could leave, I don't have to stay. But on the other hand, I think it's easier to be you, whatever you is in Berkeley. Um, I think that there's more avenues to be heard in Berkeley. At the same time, personally, I get a little annoyed at some of the, the white, what I consider like kind of like liberal Karens in Berkeley because you know, like they're the, they're the ones that will like, if a restaurant is, is like playing music too late, they're gonna like shut down the restaurant. I, you know, I miss that, I, I miss that. Um, so I don't know, that, that's what I would say. That's what I would say about Berkeley. But I mean, is there any other particular question you have? I mean, I don't know. I don't like that everything closes early in Berkeley. I like to be out late at night. Uh, in terms of the culture of Berkeley, I think it's still, there's a mixture of like, people coming in, like I say, like white or, 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 or just gentrifying people sort of coming in and wanting to impose their will on Berkeley. And then there's like old liberal people um, who don't want Berkeley to grow. And I think we need to grow. Um, very, I'm disturbed by the amount of homeless in campus. I mean, you just walk down Berkeley, there are homeless people lying on the street, on the, just on the, on the sidewalk. And I think, why aren't we doing, you know, we're supposed to be like the progressive city. Why aren't we doing anything about it? You know, I think in my opinion, we need to get uh, homeless people together, formerly homeless people, uh, community people, police, emergency services, government people, all the stakeholders together in one room and do a day where we go through a process where we come up with some solutions together. So, that's what I that's what that's what I would say about Berkeley. Some of it is like a little to me a little bit too much politically cor political correctness in terms of, and I don't mean it. I mean, or I should say some of it is a little too much. Just let's do the right thing, but what is the right thing? And I think we need to have a little some more discussions. Uh, when you look at UC Berkeley, UC Berkeley used to have a lot more black and brown students. I don't see that anymore. That's very, that's very disturbing to me. Um, it's very, dis it is, it's, 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 it's very disturbing to me to, you know, to not see the same amount of black and brown people that I used to see, you know, a lot of my friends have moved that, you know, they don't live in Berkeley, they moved to Oakland or Antioch or Hercules or somewhere. So I don't, did that answer the Berkeley question? More than I can ask. You know. With our final question here, Sema, and audience, I'm confident that you've gained a lot out of what's been shared. Sema, with our final question that we have for you, it's quite simple. What's the most important thing that we should know about you? Uh, that's not a simple question. I would say, what is the most important thing? You know, I live what I do. I live my work. I live what I do. This really is my passion. Um, and for me, you know, I look at like, I'm a lot older than a lot of other people. I hope I'd like to be younger than a lot of people, but a lot of people my age are dead. You know, they're either dead or they're going around the country visiting grandchildren in RVs, which is not very interesting to me. But I want to know that I, my work has had an imp impact on people. And also, I love music. I am so, I am like way, way, way. I was just listening to Fishbone. I don't know if you remember Fishbone. I was listening to Fishbone the other day. Um, but I, I love music. I think music really can, can change people and bring people together. I love all kinds of music. Um, and I have a 27 year old son. I think he's pretty cool. But I am willing to help anybody. You know, if you, if you're just a person and you have a question about your own issues around race, racism, um, I'll talk to anybody. I, I, I really want, I, I really want to, I want to help people change and nobody could do it all alone and we really need each other.
And if you if you don't if you're worried about what you're going to say, you don't want to say the wrong thing. Give me a call, and I'll talk to you. I'll help you. Nobody could do it alone. Audience, you've just heard from Simon Lieberman. Sima, thank you for joining our show. We're so very happy to have had you. I'm so happy to have been on this show. I'm honored. To our audience, we hope that you've been keeping safe and well. You've just gotten to know a little bit about Sima. Get to know her more. Good night. Mm-hmm.